Hey, welcome to the Bullpen Mentors video series where we talk all things personal finance with industry leaders. I am super excited to be joined in the studio today by Jay Stevens. Um, she is such an amazing guest, an award-winning leader in finance and the founder of Rich Like My Melanin. Jay Stevens is a phenomenal voice in the financial services world, and her specialty is really to um, teach her clients how to earn more and budget better. So we're super excited to be joined in the studio today with you, Jay. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Hey to everybody in the bullpen. I'm really excited to be here today. Yes, we are super excited to kind of have this conversation around job loss and how we navigate that. But I was wondering if we could kind of start out with a little bit of your background. I'd love to hear kind of how you started this amazing company, Rich Like My Melanin, and also um, how you kind of started out in the personal finance world. I know it's a crazy industry. So curious of your story. Certainly. I can share my background, how I got here. Um, so I've always been a money nerd and, and not even just a money nerd, a math nerd. I was the kid who liked to write math proofs in school and things like that. Right. <laughs> and then I went to college and I studied international business and I took my first finance course. And I always thought, why well, was like, it was just this light bulb moment when I said, this always existed. <laughs> why didn't anyone tell me finance was a thing? This seems so cool to me. And yet I graduated um, college during the recession, during the 2008 recession, 2008, 2009. Fine. So I didn't have the privilege of just saying, oh, I'm going to stay in school another year and like go deeper in finance or I'm just going to follow my passion. I had to, I had to be realistic about life and, you know, paying student loans, even though I didn't have a lot of student loans at the time and just being prepared to enter the workforce. Mm -hmm. um, so I went into when I first graduated, I became an auditor for the Navy. I did that for a few years and then I went back to school and got my MBA in finance. And then um, I still didn't do personal finance right away. I entered uh, big four consulting. So I went to wow. Deloitte, which is this huge global uh, tax audit, all of that. And even then, when I left uh, Deloitte, I stayed at Deloitte for six years. I really enjoyed it. It's an amazing company to work for. I went to tech. And when I went to tech, I was at uh, Meta. At the time, it was still known as Facebook. And the work-life balance was different. Uh, if you've ever met an auditor, they don't, they don't really have free time. <laughs> so, so I didn't have time to pursue personal finance. Right. So... The whole time that I was an auditor for the Navy and I was at Deloitte, I was my friend's go-to for finance questions. So I remember one of my friends received a letter from the IRS that said, you're being audited. And I said, oh, don't worry. Like, I got this. <laughs> so, so I looked up all the tax codification and wrote a letter back. And not only was my friend not audited, he actually um, got a larger refund. <laughs> Came back and said, oh, we think you should get more. Funny. So I just I was that person, but I never had time to really do it for myself. And then when I went to tech, um, just the, the work-life balance changed. So I finally could start Rich Like My Melon. And I originally started it as my wealth journey while I was waiting for my trademark to come in. Cool. And fast forward, we are now in year three. I have uh -huh. my trademark. I've been able to take on more clients and we're scaling in growth and getting to hang out with cool people <laughs> like, <laughs> like you, Haven. Oh. Um, so really, it started because I liked math. I liked finance. And I liked helping people out. And then once I saw I had the bandwidth to do it beyond just, you know, I'm kind of interested in it. That's when it um, really accelerated and when I could grow rich like my melanin. Yeah, it's so incredible. Also, I love how your your career journey really like follows like what you're teaching, because I know you focus a lot on how to help people in their careers. And it's so cool to see you've really had a, such an expansive career where you've been able to, you know, experience a lot of different things and transition. And I just love that that's you've been able to share that with people. It sounds like people are really benefiting from kind of your education. So definitely recommend to our mentor members, go check her stuff out. It's fantastic. So, but I know we are kind of in a crazy time right now. You kind of mentioned with the post-pandemic economy, I know a lot of people are really struggling with inflation, high interest rates. And on top of all that, I know we've got some layoffs going on, especially in tech, as you kind of mentioned before. So I was wondering if you could kind of share about your experience um, in kind of navigating layoffs and kind of share your story of how you faced that and how did you react and cope with the situation when that did happen to you? Yes. So my big layoff story, bum, bum, bum. <laughs> <laughs> dramatic music. So prior to being laid off, I mentioned how I entered tech 
And that is a really cool place to work. They just take excellent care of their employees to the extent that you understand and you just you embrace the fact that I'm this individual who can thrive. Like you look forward to doing your job wow. because you know you're so well taken care of in every other aspect of your life that you can really focus on doing your job. And so I use that um, time to really reset my finances because I, like I mentioned before, I had student loan debt. I also had credit card debt. So I already was kind of starting behind the starting line, if you will, behind the starting blocks. So during the pandemic, I just focused on let's at least get caught up. And I became very aggressive in paying off debt and saving. Wow. So in about eight months, I was able to pay off $50,000 in debt. I purchased my second investment property. I doubled my income um, and I got a new job. <laughs> so it just, it was a quick 180, but not super quick, but less than a year, I really committed to it. And then once I hit that point of, okay, you're no longer kind of in a deficit when you're looking at um, your net worth you can start saving more, you can start investing more. So I, again, and again, I had that free time to start working on my business. And that helped me because a year later, a little over a year later, I was laid off and I was minding my beautiful business. Um, I actually was on medical leave because there had been a medical issue that I needed to wow. just step away for a short amount of time and work um, on my health. And, sure. and it was really just like stress was um, affecting my heart rate, I believe. Mm, yeah. and, and the doctors were just kind of trying to figure out what was going on and what was causing me to be stressed out. And I think sure. it was just, you know, a lot going on that I was trying to process it all at one time. But with doing all of that, I was on my third day of medical leave and I got an email at 5.56 a.m. that said you have been impacted. You're one of 11,000 people who have been impacted by this layoff mm. at this organization. And it just, you're, you're, it's one thing to process I'm being laid off. It's another thing to process 11, like 10,999 other people are being laid off too. So what's going on? Right. And it's a third thing to say, I wasn't even supposed to be checking my email today. I'm supposed to be on medical leave. And mm -hmm. so, I, I mean, what, do I have insurance? Like, should I just run and get this treatment for the day and go to the doctor? And does my insurance still work? Like, how is all of this happening? But the process itself, as much as it was just a shock, and, and honestly, I felt like I've done what I was supposed to do in life. I went to school. I got the right job. I, you know, I'm respectful at work. I do what's asked of me. I speak up. I take on leadership roles. What what happened? <laughs> like what happened to the master plan yeah. that now I don't have a job? And I also had relocated for that job. So I have had family. I was raised overseas. My family's military. Wow. But I had made kind of a permanent home for myself in, D in the D.C. area, Washington, D.C. area. Okay. And so I relocated to Austin, Texas for my job. Mm -hmm. And I thought, that's great. You know, I, yeah. I'm going to make this my new home. I'm used to being transient. I was a military brat, so I can do this. And then, again, it's like a year and a half later, and you just don't have a job anymore. And mm. all of this is happening concurrently. Beyond the many other stories, Haven, I could tell you about the red flags that this yeah. was not a good place, like a good setup at the time. Mm. So I stopped and said, okay, we, we got to figure this out. And my initial reaction was just shock. I think I really could not. I just could not get my mind around it, like what all is going on. Right. And because I am a creature of habit, and this probably is just the finance and number side that I, you know, methodical, everything can be calculated. I'm analytical. The yeah. next day, I just got up like I had work. I just said, well, you know, like, I'm just going to try to act like nothing happened. I mean, obviously, I didn't go to work. We no longer had, a, I no longer had a job yeah. to go to. But I got on my computer, I checked emails. I tried to respond. I didn't post anything on LinkedIn because I just thought, you know, do, do you say something? Do you kind of quietly sit in the background? Like, how does right. all this work? And I tried my best to maintain a routine. And um, I was laid off November 9th. So right. it was just a few weeks from Thanksgiving. And I think somewhere between Thanksgiving and Christmas, the reality started setting in. Christmas shopping is different. When you, when you think, wait, where is this? this money coming from so and I thought okay I can't fly home for Thanksgiving I just don't think that's responsible but I'll fly home for Christmas yeah and I need to let my family know not that there's ever pressure to get gifts but I need to let them know you know this is what we're doing for, like 
don't expect a lot from me. And I'm I'm always known to be the cool rich auntie who just you know comes in with all <laughs> the, the, the you know, like everyone. I'm like the Oprah of Christmas. Like everyone gets something. And right. then I had to scale it back. And so it was it was like the initial shock and just surreal feeling of this can't be happening. And then it's slowly sinking in from kind of Thanksgiving to I would say New Year's. And at the same time, though, despite all of that happening, my health was getting better. So the chest pains I was having, mm-hmm. the breathing issues I was having, those were all starting to just go away. Like I was still having to, you know, take care of my health. Um, and so it, it gave me time to focus on what would help me feel more calm and more healthy in that moment. And then in January, I said, you know what? I'm going to use this to my advantage. I'm going to start spending more time focusing on building outreach like my melanin. I sometimes also call it RLMM financial solutions. Um, I'm going to focus on my health. I'm going to focus on doing things that bring me joy and trust that somewhere in this process, I'll find a job because spoiler alert, companies do not hire um, during Q4 as much. They hire for roles that they really need. And the retail industry will hire for that seasonal um, period of time. Again, a lot of shopping, high consumerism during that time of year. But the corporate roles, they tend to wait till at least the end of Q1 to hire because they want to see how they did before the year before. Um, But the retail industry kind of works on a different cycle. So it was a lot of recruiters. There were a lot of recruiters who said, we think you're great. We like your resume. You knocked it out of the park with the interview. But unfortunately, we had over 700 people apply and we only have one spot. So it's Mm. not you, but we would like to keep you on your roster or... Recruiters were losing their job because if the company's not hiring, they didn't, the company didn't see the need for recruiters anymore. So sure. then I would have a great conversation, a great um, discussion okay. with a recruiter and, they and then they get laid off and I don't know, they got, they haven't shared anything. So I'm just sending emails to people thinking, well, I guess they got really busy. Uh, so it was, it was a lot. And there was an emotional roller coaster. It started from, oh, this, you know, you're doing great. And the, the pandemic is giving you time to really build up your finance and like, you know, picturing this roller coaster going up and then your health and <laughs> the yeah. layoff and then, oh, but you're growing your business, but still the companies aren't really hiring. So it's now I feel like I'm, you know, back on an even keel. It's not as many yes. highs and lows. It's just a nice steady balance. I love that. Yeah. Going off that emotional roller coaster, I think that's something that a lot of people who maybe lose their jobs or maybe have job uncertainty go through. They just have a lot of, you know, difficulty knowing how to feel and how to stay positive. But I was just curious, you're such a kind and positive person. I can already tell. How did you stay positive and maintain that mindset during that period? And what are some strategies that you recommend people to stay motivated and focused on your goals when when kind of facing that career setback? Because I know I may have done some extra research. I know you applied to like so many jobs. So I'm curious how you stayed so motivated and so uh, positive throughout that period. One, I like that you did your research. You don't have to hide that. That's, <laughs> that's just really good journalism right there. <laughs> no, no, who you're speaking to. So I appreciate it. Um, and I generally am a positive person. So that wasn't the challenge for me. I, I think the point when it did hit a uh, lull was May. I believe. Yes, May. So I um, packed up and moved back, drove myself back from Austin to D.C. And I was staying with my mom, which I've never done. After I graduated high school, the next week I said, I'm out. (laughs) This degree, I'm going to get my college degree. I'll see y'all for the holidays. Because I I just, I'm independent like that. And so I said, oh, I got to go move in with my mom. And I asked her, you know, may I I move into your guest room? Because, you know, like... (laughs) <laughs> and obviously she knew everything and she was very supportive. You know, she said, you could have been stayed here. You didn't have to do this. Right. But I was trying to sell my home in Texas and the interest rates are so high. Mortgage interest rates are so high that people were not buying. Um, so eventually I had to switch and just rent my place out. And then I'm applying to all these jobs. Like I said, it was over 500 jobs. I mean, sorry, over 500 interviews um, and just applying and applying and trying and like, where's all this going? Um, and a lot of screenings and conversations. And I remember one day I just laid on the bed of my mom's room and I said, I, I feel like something's just, it, it just feels like failure. And I rarely feel like I've failed. It's not to say I don't fail, we're humans. It's just, I rarely feel like nothing is working out. 
And it just felt like a low point because, again, used to being optimistic and used to being able to be sure. the problem solver. And I think it helped me to realize, you know, you can try to have everything in order, but you still have to just be open and embrace the journey and what's going on. Yeah. Um, and to answer your question of, you know, what do you do? How do you stay positive? I think it helps to have people around. So one of my friends, um, she would, oh, actually a lot of my friends were checking on me regularly. They would, they would send me money to eat, even though I had groceries, but they would send me money to eat and yes. they would, I'm a Christian. So they would pray over me and they would hype me up like, you got this. And then I would wake up to, to like text messages or emails of, look, I know this one recruiter is looking for this. I think you could do this. Or yes. um, I'm going to send your resume over to this person. So it helped to have community that supported me when I was at a low point and I just felt like, okay, what else can I do? And I will, I give a lot of credit as well. Um, my, my former employer where I was laid off, they did the best they could, in my opinion, to give us a soft landing. So they didn't just say, you don't have a job, go deal with it. They gave us a very generous severance package. So I was, despite the fact that I was concerned about, you know, do I have health insurance? <laughs> the, day I, the day I found out, they gave us, and I, unfortunately, I just can't go through every detail of it. That's legal things oh, that they said we can't do. But they made sure financially, mentally, emotionally, we had a lot of resources to keep us going um, because they actually did three rounds of layoffs. So in total, for my company, they did 22,000 rounds of layoffs. Or, sorry, 20, 22,000 people were laid off across three rounds. Mm. And they made sure everyone received that comprehensive package. Yeah. Um, so between having a solid severance package and having a really good community, and just having faith and saying, look, I'm just going to keep putting this resume out. I sounded so country when I said that. I'm just going to keep putting this <laughs> resume out um, and, until something happens. And so what I, the, the term, I got to make some shape because <laughs> something is going to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's really important note for our members too. like, even if you're looking for a job and you've just been laid off, like look for companies like that care about their employees going beyond just the, you know, just the, the initial package. Like I think looking at things like severance, like reading the the Glassdoor reviews of people who maybe have been laid off or things like that. That's a huge benefit that, you know, most people don't think about when they're probably applying for a job of just, you know, how do the companies treat the people that leave the company and come into the company? So very, really good takeaway. Um, so I love that. And I'm, I'm curious. So you mentioned in that kind of answer a little bit about community. I'd love to talk to you about professional networks and how maybe those can play a role in your ability to find a new job. Could you speak to that a little bit about how maybe your professional network helped or how you can utilize things like LinkedIn to help you find a job? Absolutely. I have an amazing network and I feel like, you know, I said earlier, I'm, I'm, Oprah at Christmas time, like everyone gets a really cool gift. Yes. I feel like if I could give my network like awards, um, for those of you all who watch the show, The Office, he gave the Dundies. Yes. <laughs> like, I would give the, the Dundies to my friends um, because the network that supported me, it wasn't just one person or one organization I was part of. It was a lot of people who came together at different times. So I mentioned how my former employer, they gave us a severance package, but also my former coworkers, they kept sending me jobs and they said, I met this person. I want you to connect with this person. Can you, wow. I, I think you will be great for this. Um, for those of us who were laid off, we created a Facebook group and an Instagram <laughs> group. So we were able to send each other information. And then I had professional networks. So I'm a member of... Um, the National Association of Black Accountants, and they recognized me as a community change maker back in 2020. Oh, so I had that yeah. network to reach out to. Um, former Deloitte co-workers, they reached out and said, how can we help you? Do you want to come back to Deloitte? Are you ready to go back to consulting? I had, uh, I'm trying to think of some people at church. I would just be getting my hair done. <laughs> and my stylist said, you know, how you doing? Do you need anything? Yeah. Um, can I can I help you out? You know, don't worry about the tip this time. And it just sure. it, there were so many groups, but as far as just from a professional setting, I did have different organizations that I joined and I made sure to follow up um and to reach out to them and, and to check their job posting more often to see what they had available. And then from a kind of social media or networking way, I I chose not to put anything on LinkedIn right away. And again, I think it was just the shock of the moment and not knowing 
what to say or how to say it. And then also seeing so many people who are posting the same thing and, and just knowing how bad I felt for them. And then I also saw people who said things like, oh, I'm so tired of seeing tech layoff posts. And I thought, well, I mean, it's better to do the post and have a job. Yeah. <laughs> I say that, than someone I have a job. So I use LinkedIn to, I did update my LinkedIn to show that I was no longer employed, but I didn't make a post about it. And I think there's nothing wrong with making the post or deciding to. I made sure to pay for the premium LinkedIn package because then you could inbox recruiters. And then you could see if somebody was online or someone had checked your profile, you got early, you received early access to different jobs. So LinkedIn became a really good resource. Yeah. So that's kind of what I was, I took a lot away from what you just said. I think that people really could um, tailor their, their search to what actually fits best with their career path. Cause like you mentioned, you were in tech, so you were kind of going more towards the tech based um, application rather than just, you know, relying on Indeed or LinkedIn, which I think are good apps for sure but they're not going to be as specific or, and I love the, uh, the mom project that you mentioned. That's an amazing resource. So one I have not heard of, so we'll definitely be sure to link those in the show notes. Um, but I just love that. Cause I think another question I was going to ask you, um, is just, you know, how do you explain the gap in your resume if you're a mom and you take some time off to, you know, kind of, uh, just parent and then you come back to the workforce. So that's a cool resource for those people who might be in that boat of, you know, there are actual, platforms dedicated to people who take that journey and take that step. So love that. Um, And I'm curious kind of what strategies you use to evaluate your financial situation, kind of changing gears. I'm curious when you got laid off, I know you mentioned Christmas was coming, which is very um, relevant for right now. I know we're, as we're recording this, it's Christmas is imminent. It's just around the corner. (laughs) So what steps did you take to kind of evaluate your financial situation and make the necessary adjustments to your, your budget and lifestyle? Yes. So I think that was also part of that delay, that onset realization. <laughs> like I knew money was going to be different, but then I said, okay, I've been saving and I really have to give credit to my financial planner. I, I know sometimes people think if you're in finance, do you need a financial planner? And yes, I did because my financial planner gave me the goal of we need to build up at least six months of savings. So I had six months of savings just sitting there ready to go. And then we had, like I said, we had the severance package and I really probably could have gone. I actually was able to go almost a full year um, without having a job based on the calculation I did, which was, had you asked me that question a year before, I would have said I could make it maybe two weeks. <laughs> but I just do not have the, because I just didn't have the cushion that I wanted to have um, yeah. to make things work. So the the way I looked at it was, so I already keep a budget um, and I know budget can be the woo word for some people. Yeah. Um, but for me, it's, it's how, again, the, the way my mind works, it is how I know that I'm not going to miss a bill and or I am not going to. I can see it, but like if the bill gets too high, <laughs> what? you see how we got this natural sunlight right here. But if the electric bill gets too high, I say, wait a minute, mm-hmm. what's going on? So I keep every year. And as a matter of fact, because we mentioned earlier, we're getting close to the holiday season. Um, sometime around December, I sit down and I lay out everything for my taxes. And then I also lay out what my budget is for the year and I match it up to a paycheck. So it's like this paycheck comes in. These are the bills that get paid. This is how much is left over that goes to savings. This is what's going to a 401k, all of those things. But that's just because I like to do those things. Um, It helps because when I was laid off, I was able to say, based on my savings, if nothing else comes in, how long can I make it? Mm -hmm. And then what can I cut out? So I really like to travel abroad. I like to travel in general, but I love traveling abroad yeah. and I like to eat out. And I mean, eat at nice restaurants. Oh, it's, yeah. it's how I treat myself in life. So, right. right. Like get, I get it. two appetizers before we even mm. place the entree or <laughs> <Man. Yes. laughs> we, we got to go find some nice restaurants to go to. Um, if you're, if you're in this area, when you're in this area, because I have a whole list of <laughs> like places. If I was, if I didn't have a finance blog, I'm sure it would be some yes. blog. Like what's Jay eating? Um, to talk about it because I do enjoy a good meal. So the my treat myself restaurants. I would love to see a blog about that because that's what budgeting is really for. Yes. You know, you budget so that you to can enjoy life. Like, right. It. That's right. You're not budgeting. Yes. Just be, be sad and frugal. Super. Yeah. Frugal. It's not. Yes. We talk a lot in Torah about values based budgeting values. 
base budgeting yes. is really making the idea of whatever you value, that's what you can budget for. Yes. You don't have to value the same thing as your neighbor across the street. You can value different things and put your money towards that. So I love that. I, just as a side note, I think that's a great, uh, great way. No, to- I, I have heard it. I agree with it. I'm, and I'm glad that you all bring it up the way you do and the frequency with which you do, because it is part of what makes people feel like they can't have a budget. It's the same reason that people give up on working out. It's um, I'm excited about this in the moment, but this seems like so much more work than joy. And it's not it, the motivation isn't there anymore. Like, yeah. like it's been two weeks and I'm not rich or it's been three yeah. weeks and I haven't lost five pounds. Sure. And when it's value based, when it's connected to something that has a personal connection to you, it you, you just buy into it and you connect to it differently. Um, so when my when I when I realized I was laid off. I cut back on spending for a lot of different, um, a lot of different areas. And I said, okay, this is what I absolutely need to cover. This is what I want to cover. And just to keep me happy and healthy, this yeah. is like the one or two nice splurges and meals I can have. Sure. Fortunately, since I was home, I could cook more. I mean, I, I worked from home anyway, but I, like, I really didn't have to be in meetings all day. Right. So I could cook the meals I really wanted to cook. Um, and then for a little bit, I said, okay, I'm going to start doing my own nails. Cause I used to like to get my oh, nails yeah. done. I, said, I can do this myself. So I found ways to just kind of do incremental cuts and then also pay, pay attention to what I actually really needed to um, cover. And I call it the shoestring budget, like break it down to the shoestring of mm-hmm. the basics of what do you really need to get through and then add on more as you see, you have the space to add it. And from there, I really was able to say, this is the exact date. This will be the last paycheck or the last bill before I absolutely just need to find something else. And from there, I then backed out like, you know, two months to say, okay, if nothing else, I'm accepting whatever job I get at this. I mean, unless it's just really hanging, I'm going to accept whatever job I get two months out. Or I'm going to go back to working at Old Navy and Ann Taylor and Banana Republic. And I always say I'm slinging khakis. <laughs> I'm selling khakis and black business suits. And well, that will be, you know, enough to kind of carry me through until I get the next job. Yeah. Um, and shout out to Ann Taylor and Old Navy. Yes. <laughs> Those are some good days when I was working there. Those are fun um, days. But okay. it never came to that. I did land and uh, get a, a great job that I'm really happy at before it got to that point. Good. Yeah, I think that's a that's really important because I also think budgeting let you do that for like a year. It let you find your dream job, the one that you were kind of waiting for um, so that you did it. I think it's smart to think about it creatively. Like you don't just have to take whatever job comes your way. You can if you're budgeting and you're being smart and maybe adding in a few shifts at Ann Taylor, you can actually accept the job that you really want, even if that's, you know, waiting until the next year, which sounds crazy. I I know you mentioned you were like, oh, I can only survive two weeks, but that's what the emergency fund is for. And that's why budgeting really works is you can go that amount of time. So I think that's incredible and a really, really good note. Um, And then I'm also curious how you, if you would describe your method for researching, I know you did this a little bit. You kind of mentioned some of the, um, the websites you use, but how did you find the job that you just talked about the job you love? Um, Were there specific research kind of tools you used or factors you considered? How did it kind of guide your application process? Yes. I, this is very similar, I'll say, to dating. I know we're talking about professional stuff, but I'm going to say it's just like dating and courting. Love that. (laughs) Um, Go into it with a mindset of what you want and understand what you want. What are your boundaries? What are you, like the must-haves, the negotiables, and the, it's great if it happens, but it's not required. Sure. And making that, so um, I have a ebook that came out called The Good and Goodbye. And it talks about this process before you even apply to your first job or before you even work on your resume, write out what you really are interested in and what you want from a job. And when I say what you want from a job, like um, there's a big move now that we are going back into the office. <laughs> People don't want to go back into the office. Fortunately, my job is not doing that. I, love, I really love Good. what my employee does there. Because um, I'm grateful for You see, we're, we're in the living room. I love that. Um, but yeah. lay out what you want. So if, if you don't want to work in the office again. So there was a really great financial institution that they wanted me. I made it to the final interview. And they said, the only thing that's holding us back is that you would have to be in Austin. And I mean, it was wonderful. It was a perfect fit for me. And I just knew I couldn't stay in Austin. I knew that despite the fact that they were offering me this generous package, 
I was not going to be happy. And I told them, I said, you know, very honestly, I haven't had a good experience in Austin. And I'm con- and I know that if I accept this job, I'm doing a disservice because at some point I am going to start looking for another job, just knowing I want to be yeah. out of Austin. And so when this position becomes available and it's open in another city, it doesn't have to just be Washington, D.C. If I'm, you know, in New York, I've lived in New York before in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. I'm open to try it again. Um, and if nothing else, you know, can we stay in contact? And the recruiter said, I really appreciate and respect you saying that. They understood. They knew that I wasn't trying to, you know, run some gimmick or waste their time. Yeah. And because of that, I not only was able to stay in touch with the recruiter for other positions, when I had friends who were looking for positions with that company, I could reach out and wow. say, you know, I have this person. Are you um, interested in interviewing with them or interviewing this person for this role? My recruiter loves you. Um, so, yeah. yeah. My gosh. So they're like... Mm-hmm. I said, I bet that recruiter just loved you. They're probably like, wow, she's so, she's helping my, me do my job so well. And I think that's a good yeah. memory to leave behind. Oh, like, he's super ethical of like, honestly, like, I just want to be straight up with you. So I think that's incredible. Probably very rare, I bet, in the interview process. So yeah, that's an amazing strategy. Yeah. And you can use it in dating. Like, like, so like this is what I want. And yeah. then this is how this person acts. Did their values align with mine? Yeah. Also, to, are they asking me to do something that I just said? No, I don't. That's not my yeah. style. I'm not doing that. Totally. The bullpen is definitely not a dating show, but you know, take notes, people. This is good. This is really good. Stuff. <laughs> right, right. This is professional <laughs> advice only. Hey, you know, that's great. So yeah. things can apply in so many areas, really. That's what we learn with finances. Mm-hmm. It really goes everywhere. So love that. Um, I yeah. also just was wondering about kind of um, just kind of talking more about the logistics. Okay. So we've kind of talked about the application. I want to talk a little bit about the interview process because you did, it was at 500 interviews or something. That's- yeah. And I should correct that. I was like, no, it was 115 applications, 200 interviews, oh, two okay. different career coaches, 200 interviews. I don't know where still- 500 came from. <laughs> That's totally okay. No worries. 200 interviews is enough for a lifetime. I think people have, I've never it heard a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. And I'm curious just if you had any tips of people, you know, in interviews, just quickly for our members, like things that you want to make sure you communicate. So you kind of talked about looking for the right job. So when you're in the application, you know, it's kind of like dating, figure out what you want. But in the interview, is there anything you would recommend from a practical perspective of make sure you ask this or say this or present this way or yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. There are a list, so that I'm going back to this ebook. There's a list of resources, of, um, and it has over 30 questions to ask during an interview. I do not suggest, actually, I um, suggest that you do not try to answer or ask all those questions in one interview. Yeah. Usually, companies now, you have at least two interviews. I had one company, they interviewed me eight times, and they said, Oh, we want you to interview for another role. And I said, Okay, well, I don't know if I have this much energy left to me, but I'll try. Um, But break up those questions throughout your interview. So for example, one of the questions, if it's a consulting role, um, ask them if this role, you know, or when this project ends, am I going to be, is the onus on me to find another job? Or is it something where you're going to roll me to another project with another team? Yes. Um, For this role, I think the basic number one question, what does success look like in this role? And how did this role come to be available? So sometimes, and ideally what happens is the company's doing so great and they're growing and expanding, so they need to hire someone to help with this growth. Um, sometimes it happens because someone left that role. And so they're trying to figure out how to you know, backfill. And it's okay to ask that question as long as you're asking it from a point of view of, I'm trying to understand um, what you really need for me to make this and to make this company successful, but to make me successful as a new employee here. Um, I think it's great to talk to coworkers or who will be your, who will be your future coworkers to understand what the corporate culture is and get a perspective of what works here. You know, how, what's the corporate environment? Like how do do people hang out together outside of work? Or is this a, do your job, go home, mind your business. Mm -hmm. And one of the questions that I was asked, I know you're asking me, what should you ask during an interview? Um, sometimes I was asked, you know, why are you looking for a job right now? Or I even had one person who's kind of unprofessional, <laughs> but, but a, a headhunter who said, well, why did you, why were you laid off? You know, what happened? And so I had to explain, it wasn't just a me thing. It was 11,000 people were laid off all at once. So yeah. 
when asked, you know, why were you laid off or why are you looking for a job right now? Be honest, but be respectful. And I think that should carry you through almost any part of that interview. That honesty and respect gets you a lot further than trying to, you know, make up a response or say what you think they may want to hear. And when I say honesty and respect, it sounds like I was laid off. Unfortunately, you know, there's been a lot of cutbacks in this industry. Um, I, and unfortunately for me, I also was able to talk to my supervisor shortly after I was laid off. I, again, I, I can't say more than enough. There's not enough that I can say of the integrity and the character of the people that I worked with at my former employer, because they really did show up. And so uh, my former supervisor explained to me, I was not the problem. The company had to do layoffs and my, I was hired to automate a process. I had automated it to the point where they said, normally you could just go to another project team, but in this case, we have to do cuts. And so your role is one that we can just cut. And unfortunately we can't move anybody to other project teams, but you know, at a different time you can come back and you can be here and, you know, continue to do great things with the company. So yeah. honestly, if I just hadn't done my job, I, would <laughs> job. I just had to automate it. Joking, joking. But, but the point is that's what happened. And so that's what I explained to recruiters. I had a great job. I was doing a great job at my great job. And then I did it so well that I no longer needed to be in that role and they just had to make cuts. And so they said, which role can we eliminate? And it won't disrupt, you know, the flow of everything. Yeah. And that honesty spoke a lot better than saying, you know, I was so mad and they laid me off and they didn't listen to me. It was, it was, it was no need to make up some story. It was no need to paint them as the villain. They made a business decision as a business organization and mm -hmm. unfortunately impacted me. But fortunately, a lot of good came out of it on the backside. That's amazing. Yeah, I think that that's such a good response of if someone does ask you about that, is how to deal with that question. And I think the way you just mentioned is really the best way, just being positive where you can and having honesty and respectfulness towards that. Yeah. Towards your former employer, I think speaks volumes to a, a potential employer about your character and just the way you would handle, you know, a difficult decision. So that's great. Great advice for anyone who is being laid off is just you know, be positive and honest, be honest and be respectful. So great, great summary. Um, and then I have one final question. Just love to close us out with this kind of question uh, before we move on to hearing a little bit about how they can, our users can find out more about you. Um, the final question is what role does self-care play in your approach to handling job loss and career transitions? And how do you balance the emotional aspects with the practical? So for people to move forward. So I'm just curious if you could speak to that of how we can kind of take care of ourselves in this process of, you know, losing a job or having job uncertainty. How does that, how does that play out? Yes. Be kind to yourself and give yourself the space and grace you need. So for me, I shared that on that first day after I was laid off, I just tried to act like nothing happened. <laughs> and I got up, I, I was working out more frequently at the time. So I just got up and went for a walk. It, it happened to be a beautiful day in the neighborhood. So I felt like Mr. Rogers. <laughs> so I, I got up and I went for my daily walk and, you know, yeah. just kind of smiled and looked, waved at my neighbors like, oh, you know, still your neighbor. <laughs> At some yeah. point, I don't know what's about to happen here. Um, but then it became, again, during that like November, December period where the reality started setting in, I found more ways to include self-care. So I, for me, um, words matter. So I surrounded myself with positive affirmations, with like encouragement. I made sure, so again, Christian, I got up and I was like, let me just meditate, pray, sit still, be quiet for a second. And some days I will wake up and thought, what was me? And I kind of felt like Eeyore um, on Winnie the Pooh. I just like, this is, this is a gloomy day. I do not have a job and I want to do fun things, but I'm concerned about whether or not I can justify the expense of yeah. doing fun things right now. So that self-care helped me to find balance. And then, as I mentioned before, um, with the shoestring budget, I knew I still needed to have something in there to keep me motivated and that that value based um, personal finance goals that we talked about. So I still said, OK, I can't go get a manicure pedicure maybe as frequently as I used to, sure. but I can get this really cool manicure set on Amazon and I can do my own nails okay. and I can I maybe can't go to the spa, but I can cut off all the lights <laughs> and put, burn some candles and create a spa-like atmosphere here at home. That's right. And I can learn some new recipes 
which would be cool because again, I have the time to do it. So I did things that still brought me joy. And I still went on at least one international trip. My friend's birthday was coming up. So we went to Bali. And then on the way back from Bali, we stopped in Singapore and Frankfurt. We found a deal on it. My friend understood, you know, your budgeting. But I did cut back on some other international trips I had planned. I was going to go to Japan. I believe I was supposed to go to Cancun. I think my few friends said, let's just go to Cancun. So I, I, it was all in moderation. I said, you know, I can do some of this um, and I will plan for how to have self-care in there. And then to balance the emotional and practical steps, I think the practical steps have a list of what you have to do, what you need to do. And that's what I put in the ebook. It's the 30 days of how to navigate that process. But then in there, it's still space to say, okay, I can enjoy life. Like I'm going to go golfing or I'm going to spend time with my loved ones or doing something that still kind of gives you the practical steps, the what you need to get done, but gives you kind of the freedom to still feel sane, safe, balanced, some level of normalcy, because you do need that, especially if you've been working for a long time. You need that kind of routine to not just completely feel like you lost such a big part of your life. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. That makes so much sense. And uh, Jay, I love hearing so much about your ebook throughout this. I want to give you opportunity. Can you tell us where our users can find a little bit more about you? And then um, I want to make sure we get them this amazing discount code that you mentioned earlier that they can, they can get your ebook. So yeah, tell us a little bit about where the, our users can find you. All right. So to find um, the book, The Good and Goodbye, if you go to my website, RLMM Financial, which stands for rich like my melanin financial dot com. And then look for, it's the first, it's the featured product, um, The Good and Goodbye, How to Navigate Job Loss. And not only does it have that 30-day guide in there, it has a list of websites to find jobs. So we mentioned a few in this call, but there's more. Uh, there's a lot more. Um, it also has websites for professional organizations. So places where you can continue to take training and um, like how you have Udemy, you can kind of stay relevant and tech skills there. Wow. It also has those questions, 30 questions to ask your interviewer. It has free space for you to kind of write and get your ideas out. And then as a bonus, it has um, included a copy of how to save 20 hours a week with AI. So I started using AI a lot to streamline this process. And there's AI tools that will do everything from plan a vacation for you to take a professional headshot so you could have a nice, clean photo on your LinkedIn. Yay. So all of that is in the good and goodbye, how to navigate job loss, which is available right now. And for all of our lovely bullpen family members, we are <laughs> going to use the discount code mentor group. It will be in the, the link in the description in the caption yeah. below. Um, so if you use that, You'll get a bonus discount on top of all of this um, because, you know, if you're navigating job loss, you kind of aren't in a position to spend a lot of money. So hopefully this will help you um, get through. And if you really are going through a hard time, I personally check my emails. Email me. I will I will figure something out. We, we can. I want to help as many people as possible. And I would much rather help than just say, oh, you know, figure it out. Um, so as many people as poured into me, let me help and pour into other people. So if you need help. Um, I really do check my emails, hello at rlmmfinancial.com, and we will figure something out to get you going. That. That we can do a one-on-one -on -one session, whatever is needed to get you there. Sounds good. And Jay, also, I was going to mention to you, for our Mentoro members, the members of our platform, feel free to also bring any of these amazing takeaways that Jay's kind of brought to us in to a one-on-one -on -one with your money mentor. They'd be happy to talk to you all about this awesome bullpen and help you come up with a strategy of, you know, how you can um, financially plan for a job job loss and just how to how to financially recover from that so yeah our money mentors are also here as a resource for you guys as well so well jay this has been an amazing interview i've really appreciated all your insight you have an incredible story and i know our members are going to get so much out of it really really appreciate you and again for our members thank you guys so much for joining us and we'll catch you next time in the bullpen 